do it, man. Excellent. Hey, folks, John Kelly. Welcome back. Law Enforcement Life Coach with your Sometimes Heroes Need Help podcast. Sitting down with Randy Sutton. Yeah, that Randy Sutton, 34-year veteran, nationally known media commentator. Um, did 34 years and is still giving back to this community of ours. The founder of the Wounded Blue. And um, we're going to get into all things law enforcement, all things first responder, and how we do a better job of not only taking care of ourselves, but taking care of each other. So without further ado, help me in welcoming Randy Sutton to the Law Enforcement Life Coach, Sometimes Heroes Need Help podcast. Randy, it's nice to see you. Oh, it's a pleasure, John. Thanks for having me on your show. No, it's my pleasure, man. I um, Of, of all things, actually, we know some people in common. Uh, Jason Schechterly, David Berez. I haven't met uh, Jenny yet, Jenny Hill, but uh, these are all folks in this. You would think as big as this profession is 750,000 plus that we wouldn't have folks in common, but this wellness space is, is, is relatively small. Yeah, it is. And, and, it, but it's expanding, which is, which is very healthy. You know, we've, we've done such a lousy job taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other over literally, you know, the, the, the decades before where we never even recognized that uh, post-traumatic stress was was really a, a true issue. So, you know, now that um, we're, we're coming of age, if you will, there is definitely a movement that is healthy within the law enforcement community to, um, to actively engage in training and, and, and uh, you know, creating an environment that's healthier for our law enforcement officers. And, and it's a long time in coming, John, uh, you know, you and I grew, grew up as, I mean, we're dinosaurs now, but, uh, you <laughs> That's know, a nice way of putting it, <laughs> but you know, uh, we weren't, we weren't given a lot of the opportunities that these officers have now. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, that we'll see a, a healthier law enforcement community as a result. Uh, I, 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 I think that we're on the right they're definitely on the right path. Before we delve into all things, and I want to talk about the culture because you, you had alluded to the fact that guys that have been in the job for 30, 30 plus years, you don't know what you don't know. And 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 so, you know, PTS and, and, and I never realized suicide was an issue in our profession until I retired. It just it, really the, the things we don't talk about, the things that, you know, it, it wasn't until you start peeling back some layers that you realize, you know, we've got a lot of issues that need addressing. But before we get into all that, Randy, give us a little uh, synopsis, if you will, on on your career, getting you up till this point, if you would. Sure. So um, I did 34 years total as a cop. I did 10 in the state of New Jersey in a small town of uh, Princeton. Uh, that was my hometown. That's where I grew up. And that's where I became a cop at the ripe old age of 19. If you if you can imagine. Yeah, that. I, I'm imagining somebody had to buy your rounds for you. I had to have my mom buy my bullets. Yes, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Good. Stuff, Here I am man. getting ready to go into the New Jersey State Police Academy. That's too funny, <laughs> man. That's awesome. Started at 19. Started at 19. You know, it's funny because I thought I was I, I was ready to be a cop at 19. I look back now on some of the decisions that I made as a 19 year old cop. Oh, man. And, and I, it makes my head explode. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, no doubt. But, no doubt. But I always knew I was going to be a cop. And I was very fortunate that I that I was given that opportunity, you know, so so early in life. But I got I got 10 years into it. I was a detective. I was the top of my pay scale. But I was just bored to death, man, in a small town. Okay. You know, we, you know, we, it was a very wealth, Princeton's a very wealthy town. You know, the, the biggest things we dealt with really on a normal basis were, you know, drunk college students. So sure. it just wasn't a challenge to me. Gotcha. And I, uh, I, I decided I was going to go somewhere else. So I started researching different police departments. And I, I actually tested at a, at a department down in Florida, which will remain nameless, 
uh, for for uh, for a good reason. And and uh, uh, I can went I down guess? There and I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to confirm or deny. All right, brother. <laughs> And I went down and tested, and uh, they were going to hire me, and they let me do a ride along for a few nights. And uh, I was very—I mean, I was like, "Well, I'm excited, okay," because it was a right. big—it was a big department. And um, I, I'm so ha I'm so thankful they let me do a couple ride alongs because I probably would have taken the job had I not been exposed to what I saw, and I, what I saw was a culture of um, uh, that I would not be. I wouldn't let me put it this way. Look the at you. Now listen, can we can we stop with the political career? You were <laughs> trying your damnedest, man, to avoid. Oh, all right. You're killing right, me, Randy. You you're killing me. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. God. So so you know, every police department has has a a um a manual, right? They have the sure. the, the manual, the you, you know for officers that you have to know the policy and the procedure. And I never read their manual, but somewhere in it, there must have been a rule that said, you will kick everybody's ass, <laughs> whether they need it or not. Ah, yeah, well. They need, um... you, you will kick everybody's ass. So what I saw there. Um, uh, not, a lot of mean, I, not a lot of community policing going on. There was, <laughs> there was. I never saw a sleeping man get his ass kicked before. Oh uh, my god! But uh, but I saw them be be yeah. And so I was like, oh, you know what? I don't have anything to do with this. So anyway, I came back to Princeton, and I was telling the story of my experience down in this department. And two FBI agents uh, came up to me afterwards and said, "Hey, Randy, if you're looking for a really good agency, right? Um, go to Las Vegas Metro PD." And this was remember this is in the mid '80s. Okay. And at the time, uh, Las Vegas was the fastest growing city in America. Okay. So I came out and started my career all over again, John. I had to go through the academy again. No, no, no crossover. Transfers. No, no, for your 10 years. No, nope. weren't having nope. it, huh? No. Nope. And, and took a $10,000 pay cut. Right. Wow. So it was a big decision to, you know, I was halfway to retirement basically sure. in New Jersey. Of course. But I got to tell you, I never looked back on that decision. And uh, Las Vegas was a fantastic place to be a cop. I did 24 years here. Right. And um, can and I ask you, Randy, because I'm not familiar with Vegas. Uh, the, the, the few times that I've been there, I don't think we ever got off the strip. And I know that's not the, the summation of, of Las Vegas Metro. Um, is it much like... Uh, many other urban areas where they have um the gated high-end communities and then your you know middle of the road and then maybe some or more of your rough and tumble areas yeah ex exactly and and the strip area um uh, although i did work it several times during my career believe it or not that's not where the action is gotcha the action is in where people really live so right. um and and of course we had we have areas that are you know uh, gang infested. We have we have high end areas just like every other community. Okay. But the 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 difference and the interesting part about being a Vegas cop is you get exposed to everything here. You know it's uh, it's a twenty four hour town. You're in fact I worked my my entire career as a lieutenant. I purposefully worked the graveyard shift. Okay. Because in Vegas, that's where the action is. Yeah. You know, you're 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 constantly busy. And uh, uh Las Vegas Metro, just for your just so you, you, you get a you get a flavor for the organization. Um uh, it's a it's a it's a different kind of police agency because it's a combined sheriff's department and police department. In 1972. The, the Clark County Sheriff's Department merged with the with the Las Vegas City PD okay to form the Metropolitan Police so every cop here is a deputy as well as being a police officer okay. and the and the head of the organization is the sheriff is he, so they had, he's, they had, a, he's elected I imagine correct he's an elected okay. sheriff they chose that they, they didn't want a police chief they wanted the, an elected sheriff to actually be the boss of the organization. I'm glad they did because we all know this that 
um, police chiefs serve at the whim of the mayor and council. True. And so they have to toe the, the line, if you will, or they get fired. Right. Well, at least with an elected sheriff, he answers to the people. And so um, having worked under both a chief in Princeton and a sheriff in Metro, I'm, I'm, I think that, that the way to go is to work for an elected sheriff. Yeah, we've, so got sheriffs in, we've got sheriffs in Florida that are the sheriffs for as long as they want to keep running. Um, you know, we've got sheriffs uh, 16 years. As I mean, the, they keep they do a good job. The people keep voting them in, you know, right. funny how funny how right. that works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, so it, it was I, I had to go through the academy again, though. I had to go through field training again. And but I'm glad I did because um, I got to tell you, policing in Princeton and policing in Vegas are two different animals altogether. Now remember, my whole reason for coming to Vegas was to was to more action, right? Well, be careful what you wish for, <laughs> because sometimes yeah. you may get a little more than you thought. So I was still on probation when I was in my first shooting. Okay. And uh, and and it was a real eye opening. I was I was um, in an area that was heavily gang infested. Uh, I was in a pursuit with a stolen car, and they they crashed. They bailed. I ran after one. My partner ran after another. And uh, it's two thirty in the morning, and the suspect I'm I'm right behind him, but I can't quite get my hands on him. And he goes around the corner of a building, and as I go around the corner of the building. He's he's now stopped and he's going to ambush me, and I've walked right into looking down the barrel of his gun, and um, th thankfully my training was very very good. You know, you know we, we train for, you know our, our entire careers, for a moment that in most police careers will never happen, True. and that is using deadly force. So as I came around the corner, he was waiting for me. And I, I snapped a shot at him and it missed his ear by about a half an inch. But what it did, it impacted with the, the stucco wall behind him and a piece of stucco hit him in the head. <laughs> so he thought he was shot. He thought he got hit. He thought he got hit and, and threw that gun down. Well, it turned out he was 15 years old. And uh, the realization that a 15 year old is willing to kill you for what? a stolen car right and uh that's a reality check man so um yeah no doubt. it's hardcore here vegas is hardcore yeah that's um yeah those kind of experiences early on they uh they're defining yeah yeah it was uh it was and and, and that was that was my first one I was I was involved in five shootings while I was here, in in, in Metro. Okay. And including just before I retired, I, I have the I have the distinction or, yeah. I don't know if that if that's no, the right we'll, we'll word. say distinction. But, Distinction's good. I like but, distinction. But uh, I, I, I'm one of the only lieutenants who ever actually got involved in it on duty shooting. Right, because you're supposed to be in the office, right? You're supposed to be in the office, right? That wasn't a place for me. Wow. Um, but it was, uh, I'll tell you the, the opportunities that were afforded me here, um, were, were life-changing, you know? Um, and I, I can't imagine if I had stayed, if I had stayed in Princeton, I would have been bored to death. I wouldn't have gotten shot to death. I'd have been yeah, bored you, to death. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And that's, you know, that's the thing that I think keeps us, I mean, we get involved in the profession to be to to do to do to be active to make a difference and that's kind of hard to do when there isn't a hell of a lot going on um your time in vegas if i remember reading yeah you, you had an issue with uh, an injury and it, it kind of i don't want to say brought you more into the spotlight if that's even possible um you you want to talk about that because is that was that the foundation or the idea behind Wounded Blue, Randy? Yes, yes, absolutely. So before we get into that, I, I just want to talk a little bit about more about 
what I experienced during my career because Absolutely. that that will play a role in in the understanding of of uh, what took place after I retired. So, um, absolutely, I was very fortunate to have been chosen to be on the TV show Cops in okay. the in the early years. Like uh, 1989 was the first year, right, the, of the show, second year of the show, and I was featured prominently in that, and that led to me being uh, again, though, as a sergeant in the next time, 94, and then again in the in 96 so throughout the years i've been on I've, I've been featured probably more than any other cop or in in the in the country sure so that created another opportunity because from that um one day i get a call from a from a um, casting agent randy where there's going to be a film shot in vegas and they're looking for realism in the part of a police officer would you be willing to come down and do an audition? I said, sure, why not? I'll, I'll, I'm always up for a new adventure. Right, right, right. And I and I walk into this suite, and who's standing there but Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese, and it was for the film Casino. No kidding. And so uh, my my audition consisted of me telling them funny stories about being a Vegas cop. Okay. And, and they said, you got the part. That landed you That's, the role, man. That landed me the role, and I've been doing movies and TV ever since. So once again, another opportunity that, um, but it also played a role in where I'm going to take the where I'm going to take this story. Yeah. So, um, so I was in, and then I, and then I, I, I uh, became an author as well. Um, you know, before we go the things... into being the author, so you, you did Casino. Were there were there some other movies that you uh, were involved? Yeah, in? yeah, I did uh, Fools Rush In okay. with Salma Hayek. In fact, my part in that movie, and this is kind of amusing, my part in the movie was delivering her baby, Sama Hayek's baby, on the bridge at, at Hoover Dam. That was okay. my part. I played a Hoover Dam cop, right? There you go. And so I can legitimately say I was between Sama Hayek's legs for three days. There you go. That's not a bad place to be, my friend. What are you going to so, do? <laughs> don't, 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 no I, hating on Randy. <laughs> And then I did, uh, I did. Uh, so I did Fools Rush In. I did Miss Congeniality too with uh, with uh, uh, Sandra Bullock. Okay. And uh, and a, a bunch of other films and TV shows down down the line. So nice. now, um, you know, every every cop has an experience that changes their lives sometime during their career. Sure. And one of those experiences happened to me in uh, 1998. And it was, uh, uh, I saved the life of a one-month-old baby who was shot in the face in a drive-by shooting. Okay. Literally, her and her mom, mom and dad are driving to the store right off the strip. The baby is in, one-month-old baby is in a car seat. And these three gang punks pull up alongside of them. And what we found out later was a gang initiation. And just opened fire on the car. Hmm. Absolutely no reason. Just did it. Right. And... I happened to be literally driving um, a half a block from the scene and I came upon the scene, hmm. right? The car is up on the sidewalk. People are running around screaming. I have no idea what it is. I don't know that it's a shooting. Sure. I just know that there's, there's, you know, some type of mayhem that took place here. And I radioed for a backup and I got out and there's bullet holes all over the car and people are screaming and I have no idea if the shooter's still there. You know, you know the mayhem at a, right, right. At a scene. It's just very confused. Yes, it is. And suddenly somebody screams, oh, my God, the baby's been shot. And I look down and there's this little infant, little tiny thing. Right. And um, a bullet hit her in the face. Hmm. And she and she I checked her and she wasn't breathing. So I knew that I couldn't wait for the ambulance, even though that's the protocol. Right. But um, so the first unit that got there within seconds, I scooped up the baby. I says, get us to the hospital and radio. We're bringing in a baby that's not breathing. Well, what happened was when the bit, when the bullet hit the hit her face, you know, her head's the size of a softball. Sure. And a bunch of tissue and blood and stuff went down her throat and choked her. Okay. And I was able to clear her airway and give her mouth to mouth and bring her back. That's awesome. And because I was there literally within, you know, 
minutes of the of the activity, no brain damage. Oh, that's, you know, that's great. something we, we're always concerned. So anyway, I I went that that affected me in 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 a very dramatic way, right? So I went home that night, and me and Johnny Walker, yeah, right. um, um, got out a yellow pad, and I wrote the story. Okay, called her name was Jackie, and I, you know, I didn't have anything to do. I didn't write it to do anything with it. I wrote it because I felt like I needed to put it on paper sure. so I could understand it. Yeah, help you process it. Exactly, exactly, and um, um, and I just stuck it in a drawer. And it sat there for years until uh, September 11th happened. And when the trade centers went down, I felt like I wanted to do something and participate because it was such a, you know, it was the deadliest day in law enforcement sure. history. And I, and I, I felt a little helpless because I couldn't do anything. But then I remembered that that story it was in that drawer. And I thought to myself, you know, Every cop I know has a story like this. I'm right. going to ask police officers to write those stories. I'm going to put them in a book and I'm going to donate all the royalties to the Widows and Orphans Fund for the cops who were killed in 9-11. Okay. That's exactly what I did. And that became my first book, True Blue, Police Stories by Those Who Have Lived Them. And I raised a significant amount of money nice. for, for, the, for the NYPD Widows and Orphans Fund. And that led to my writing career. And then I did uh, my second book was called A Cop's Life, which were all my own stories. And it's still available today. And then I did a second edition of True Blue, which I donated to the uh, National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund. OK. And then I did. And now I have a new one coming out, actually, in, in a couple of months. Talk to called me. Res Rescuing 911, the fight for America's safety. OK. And so anybody wants a copy of that, um, they can get on the list. Yeah, we'll, we'll put all that information in the show notes for everyone. Good. Rescuing911.org. Just go on the list, say, I want to be notified when it comes out. Excellent. So um, now, why am I telling you all this, right? I, it's not to toot my own horn, believe it or not. Um, but, and then one of my jobs with Metro was I became a police trainer. I, okay. was, I was in charge of advanced training for the agency. And so... I uh, actually wrote an article called Policing with Honor, Surviving Your Career Ethically. Hmm. And it touched a chord with a lot of different agencies. And I started getting contacted. Randy, do you do a presentation on this? So I did. I created hmm. one. And I trained thousands of cops across the country. Now, my career ends. My career, I did not intend to retire when I did. But I suffered a stroke in my police car. Huh. Right on the Las Vegas Strip. That's what ended my police career. And uh, I was watch commander that night. I'm driving down. I had a, a young patrol officer with me because, you know, Met Metro is a big department. It's the ninth largest department in the country. And so when I was watch commander, I would take a patrol officer with me so I could get to know my people. Sure. So I got this young man riding with me. He's never ridden with me before. And we're driving down Las That's Vegas always Boulevard. fun, right? I'm going to get to go ride with the lieutenant tonight. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Did I draw the short straw or what, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I like the concept, but I know well, I, it must get, have been that, uh, something That's where you get to know what's going on, right? So oh, I, I have absolutely. this young man with me. We're, we're It's 2.30 in the morning. We're driving down the strip. And I literally felt my brain slowing down. And I knew I was having a stroke. So I stopped the car right in the middle of the road. And I said, get me medical. I'm having a stroke. And this poor kid looks at me like, is he messing with Come me? Come on, man. Right? It's one of those tests, right? It's yeah. Like, yeah, yo, yeah exactly. bang, where are we at, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> so oh, man. He, he, he realized this was the real deal. He called for, you know, called for an officer needs help. And I got out of the car in case he needed to get me to the hospital and I started speaking gibberish huh. and I couldn't control it. I knew I was speaking gibberish and then I lost the ability to speak. And I lost the ability to move and I just crumpled to the pavement mm. completely helpless. That's some scary stuff, man. It was, well, you know, I've been in some scary stuff, right? Right. Right. 
Well, that was the that was the scariest thing I've ever. Yeah. I, and I here's the thing: I, I wasn't imagine. afraid to die. I wasn't yeah. afraid to die. Right. I was afraid to live like that. Mm. I was actually praying to die. <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow. Yeah, Beth. And uh, but once again, that angel that's been on my shoulder my entire career was with me again. And the clot went through my brain, did minimal amount of damage, but it ended my police career. And then what happened changed the trajectory of my life forever. And that's my own department turned its back on me and said, we're not paying your medical bills. We're not giving you your benefits. Have a nice life. That's, and, a, that, that's, that's a slap in the face to say the least. And I was, I was shocked. Yeah. I, I, I mean, of all the things that I never expected, that's what I never expected. Right. And I said, but you, you have to pay my medical benefits. You have to give me my benefits. It's the law. Right. Yeah. But, uh, make us. Right. And, and, and that feeling of abandonment, that feeling of alone, here's my quote, police family, unquote, as dysfunctional as it is. Sure. They just threw me away, threw me away. I even went to go see the sheriff who I served with for 24 years. Right. And I said, Sheriff, how do you treat me like this? Right. And he looked me dead in the eye and said, Randy, this isn't personal. It's just business. And I came to find out that that truer words were never spoken. See? Right. Well, uh, okay. It is just, okay. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it that it's just business, but it's bad business because you, you can't do that. You know, I'm not asking you for a favor. Yeah, that's right. I'm not asking you for a favor. I'm asking you for for you to do what what you are legally obligated, obligated to, to do. do yeah so they knew they knew if i i had to get a lawyer i had to go to i had to go to administrative court it took over a year right and here's the here's the really frightening part of this and what 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 i, I came to learn they knew it was going to take over a year they lost every hearing along the way Sure. They paid tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayers' money to fight me. But they were playing a game. And that game was, let's hope he dies in the meantime. We're going to wait, wait him out. We'll wait him yeah. out. Drag this and on. That's, and that's what they were hoping. They were hoping I was going to die. Well, when you when you come to that realization that you are so, you know, that, that, that you here you did. I gave 24 years of my life. I almost gave my life on more than one occasion. Sure. So, uh, but I thought I was the Lone Ranger, right? You know I what's crazy, was... Randy? Like, you're a highly decorated Las Vegas Metro officer. Um, you're, you're extremely well known in the community, and they just shit on you. If if they're going to do that to you, what's the, the, the patrolman who's just, you know, with three years on, just making his way? He doesn't have a chance. And, and and is that's exactly the point. And and because of writing the books, because of being in the movies and being on cops, I was I was a visual presence in the law enforcement community. And suddenly, cops start reaching out to me. Randy, I know you don't know me, but I I I want I don't have anybody to talk to. I was shot in the line of duty. They thrown me away. My chief never even came to visit me in the hospital. Randy, I know you don't know me, but I was hit by a car. I can't walk anymore. My department abandoned me. I mean, one after another. Sad. This is when Facebook Sad. was coming, yeah. right? And yeah. I realized that, holy shit, there, there's got to be a resource for these men and women. Because every every conversation ended with, I feel abandoned and I feel alone. And then, of course, the worst is, I wish I died that night. Mm. At least I wouldn't be a burden. Right. Heartbreaking stuff. Sure. Absolutely. Heartbreaking. And I and then I and then I came to find out because I was looking for resources for these men and women, realized there was no national resource. And so I created it. That is the Wounded Blue. And we are the national assistance and support organization for injured and disabled law enforcement officers, a nationwide charity that's now helped. John, this this is going to blow your mind. We've helped more than 14,000 cops in the last five years. That's awesome. That's it. But here's, that, the, here's the heartbreaking part. 
we shouldn't even need to exist. <laughs> isn't that isn't that isn't that the kicker? It's like the, the the fact that your organization one is that busy in in, in addressing those needs in, in an environment where, like you said, they should you shouldn't you shouldn't be helping anyone. Quite frankly, agencies should be doing what they're obligated to do. Right, and and. And I tell you, I have an amazing team of people. I have more than 50 officers that are all volunteers. Every single one of these persons has been shot or stabbed or beaten or run over, screwed up and screwed over. And every one of them wants to continue to serve. Some are in wheelchairs. Some are on crutches. Many will never, will never walk again. And yet, they are so dedicated to wanting to help and wanting to play a role that they are... They are the backbone of the Wounded Blue. They are the peer advocate support team of the Wounded Blue. And they're literally saving lives. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but each year we hold a um, we hold a, 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 an annual conference called, called uh, the National Law Enforcement Survival Summit. And we just held it in Vegas. This is our third year doing it. And it is, an, there's nothing like it in the United States. It's every aspect of surviving a law enforcement career, physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, financially, relationships. It is absolutely life-changing. And this year, um, a, a, pre, a previous attendee stood up and said, I want everyone in this room to know that the wounded blue saved my life. That's awesome. I had every intention of killing myself. And because of what the Wounded Blue did, I'm here, I'm healthy, and my life is good. That's awesome. That's the power of what the Wounded Blue is. It's amazing when uh when people that care come together, we can do we can do some amazing things where uh other organizations and departments just they fail. Um that's quite a testament to what you guys are doing. And it's, uh, it's greatly appreciated. Greatly appreciated. So, so for, for, you know, here's the thing. We're a resource literally for every cop in America. And, and, in, and, you know, and this is kind of interesting too. So now we, we have a new sheriff who just got elected last year. Okay. And he's a contemporary of mine. We serve together and he knew about my organization and, when he was running for election, he came to see me and he said, Randy, I know what happened to you. I don't want that to ever happen to anybody on this department again. Would you give me advice when I get elected and I am going to get elected? Would you give me advice on how to make sure that we take care of the people? Yeah. And, uh, and sure enough, um, he's actually created an entire wellness bureau that is now in the, in the, in the beginning of its uh, new life. Right. And, and, and I'm an advisor to him on that. So how about, you know, from going from, from one extreme where they just threw me aside right. to, and that gives you an idea of what leadership can do. Sure. Right. So you just got to care so that you got to give a shit. Yeah, you got to care. Right. Right. So what makes us unique is that we are literally you know, even even police agencies that try to do it right, John, you know, that, that have their own peer support teams and such, there's still such a distrust of the agency itself that many cops are scared to death to right. go ask for help. So that's where we're that's where we're really, really well suited. Um, and actually, 70 percent of our um, of our involvement with cops come from people we've already helped. Okay. They refer, they refer their friends, their partners to us, and I, I think I don't think there's a better testimony or testament to the effectiveness and the usefulness of our organization than that. Yeah, that that's you, you hear that time and time again, Randy. That you know, it's not that I I I, I won't get help, right? It's where do I go that there's not going to be any fallout. That right, you know, because right. in, inevitably there there are very few agencies that 
treat the employee the way they need to be treated during that time of a, a mental health crisis or, or, or an injury of sorts. More often than not, they get treated like a liability. And, and right. you know, I don't want to be treated that way. I don't, I don't, I've worked hard my whole career to get where I'm at. I don't want to be taken off the team. I don't want to be benched. I don't. And so what the wounded blue is doing, it's, it's, it's another resource. It's another Avenue of assistance and, and help that doesn't need to go through the agency. If there's that fear of some sort of retribution or right. somehow you're going to be uh, ostracized if you uh, ask for help. And you know what? Um, I've actually had a number of, of uh, police chiefs and sheriffs that have reached out to us and said, Hey, can you help us? Sure. Um, so we, and we're a resource for, for every chief too. We've had, I've sent teams of peer support personnel to various parts of the country when they, when requested to do so. Sure. And I mean, we were at the Capitol for an extended period of time. Um, we were, we, we, we've been, we've been around, right. We've been all over the place because yeah. we're responsive. So there are chiefs that, that know that, that our organization exists. Um, but getting the word out that we're here is, is a, is a big problem. There's still, most cops don't even know we exist. Right. So, you know, by going on to a podcast like yours, where you have law enforcement who listens and watches, this is, how we need to do it on a grassroots level sure so that you know now everybody that's listening to this or sees this is going to know that the that the wound of blue is there for them 100 percent. and that's 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 the power of what you do with your podcast and and this is how we reach our audience and this is how we we change lives and save lives it's um it's like you said it, it it's a shame that your organization has to exist. It, it, yeah. it should be a no brainer for agencies, but, but in, in speaking to that, Randy, um, you know, when you and I came up, th there was no such, th no, not only did we not discuss our feelings or emotions or, or how we felt after a call, PTS wasn't a, a there was no such thing. You didn't have it because all you, you know, you, 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 you drank yourself uh, into oblivion and then you just went back to, to get after it. You know, we're, we're seeing the effects now of decades of uh, uh, self-medication with alcohol and pills and everything else. And yep. I think it's getting better. Uh, I think, we're having more conversations, but I got the saying, man, Randy, things didn't get messed up overnight. So they're not going to get fixed overnight. It, it, it's going to changing a culture, right? Takes right. time, takes time. And, uh, but I think this is, is a great step forward. And um, I, I think not that we have to be careful, but, but moving forward, there's a lot of folks that are really well intended, but I, I, what are your thoughts? I think this has to be from the bottom up, quite on. I mean, waiting for the chief or the sheriff to care about you, you might be waiting a long time. So I, 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 I think there's a component to all of this that even though we're, we're talking about, you know, organization supporting, um, what are your thoughts on this? I think that you need to be your biggest advocate. Well, and that's why, that's why, that's the power of peer support. Right. That's the power of peer support that, that it's, it's a patrol officer caring about another patrol officer. We're like the family, you know, you know, we always talk about the thin blue line, right? Right. The family. And we all know it's bullshit. You're, you're right? gonna, you know? I was going to say, you're going to get me all jacked up now. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, 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 sh we shit on each other to, to the, yeah. if, if the public only knew, I think they, they would be ashamed. I, I'm ashamed. Right. I'm ashamed. Well, they, I, they I believe watched... the movies, 
Randy. They yeah. believe that everybody has each other's back. Yeah, we uh, we well, I I call it we eat our own. Of course. And uh, and and it's it's shameful. It really is. Um, I mean, I experienced it. It's, I you know the funny part. I experienced it more in Princeton, in a in a town of with thirty cops, than I did with a metro that had thousands of cops. Mm-hmm. I experienced more of that now from a from a leadership standpoint um the leadership has a dramatic effect on whether somebody suffers from post traumatic stress because in institutional uh, institutional values and and the way that that the that the um leadership treats their people uh-huh. sometimes when they're physically injured leads to post-traumatic stress Absolutely. they actually create it they, do. they create institutional post-traumatic stress well that's the thing I, I i think i have this theory right that the incident is the incident whatever it is right um it's how it's whether or not you feel supported to go ahead and get the help that you know you need after being involved in something that does or doesn't create the post-traumatic stress. Um, and, and that's that's where I think the shift needs to, I, I, that whole empowerment. You know, you know, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it, Randy. When I present, I, I quote often that serenity prayer. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to right. change the things that I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, I've worked for some great bosses over my 30 years, worked for some that I, I wouldn't piss on if they were on fire. Uh, cause they just, they completely missed the opportunity of the position that they, you, you're not the chief because you know, somebody made you the chief because they thought you'd do a good job of taking care of the people. And what ends up happening is that, um, that ends up being a self-serving role, you know, for a, a million of million reasons that we can, uh, you know, agree to disagree on. But I think right. at the end of the day, that leadership component, and, you know, there's people you and I both know in that space that talk directly to that, that there's really, I was at a seminar a couple of weeks ago and they had some sheriffs talking, you know, about leadership and, and, and not one of them mentioned Their role is to take care of their people. Period. All these lofty, you know, flow charts and this. And, just stop, man. <laughs> stop. Your job is to give a shit about your people more than yourself. If you can't get that right, man, uh, I, you know, I don't know what the hell we're doing. And, um, there aren't many things that you can distill down into some simple, you know, I like simple, man. Simple works for me. Um, care more about your people than you do yourself. That's the the, the, the trait of a, an excellent leader. Uh, I'm sure there are some others, but I think that's a good starting point. I couldn't agree more. And, and, and if, if more leaders adopted that, we'd have a lot less problems, but you know, you, you, <laughs> You have a lot of selfish, a lot of self-centered, selfish people that have been put into positions. But you know what? That's 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 life, man. People right. are people. What's and, your uh, uh, what's your take, Randy? You've been in the game for a long time. You know, you hear there's a re- recruitment issue. There's a retention issue. There's you know, uh, the, I don't. There are agencies across the country that are you know horribly understaffed um you're you're the king R- randy sutton is king for a day man what what are some of the things from a uh, an institutional level from a, as a profession what are some things that you would like to see implemented to uh turn this thing around of ours right no we're we're in a we're in a uh, a crisis law enforcement the criminal justice system is in a crisis that we have never seen before. 
And uh, this is a generation now, this has become a generational issue. Um, we have the lowest amount of cops that we've had in decades. And that is because we have, we have um, lost so many good cops due to the political environment that is now pervasive throughout the law enforcement community. You have leadership which absolutely failed their cops, absolutely failed. You have you have uh, leadership at the at the upper levels of government. Hell, we got a president who is as corrupt as corrupt could be, and everybody knows it. He's lawless. He's he's got a Department of Justice that is lawless. I mean, you and I grew up, you know, uh, working with the FBI, um, and we all knew that they had their flaws. You know, <laughs> through a lot like, of ego like all involved. of us, right? Yeah. But but now they have gone. the The leadership has gone from the untouchables to the untrustables. Yeah, no, and I like so the way you, you put that. So you you have you have a you have a crisis at the upper levels of of uh, just lawlessness. Now you have the um, the fact that so many police officers have resigned straight out or right. retired early because of the environment right. and the environment is that these officers are scared to death of getting sued of getting arrested of being prosecuted of being persecuted by the very agencies and the very cities that they serve we have seen yeah it, it, it and so now and who the hell who the hell wants to become a, a cop now Right. When I took when I tested for Las Vegas PD, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it was the same when you did, yeah. five thousand people, they cut off the applications at five thousand. Yep. For a hundred jobs. Yeah. This was um, now, you, you Louis, were you were you were blessed to get an interview. Statistically, it was more difficult to get a police job than become a doctor. Right. Now, now um um St. Louis just gave a police test. Not one person showed up. Not one person showed up. So you have you have now have, you have a crisis of not enough cops. You can't get cops. So what are departments doing? And here's the other here's the other side of this coin. The Department of Justice. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, I. Go, go, I'll continue, but I, I think you and I are on the same page with this. Go ahead. The Department of Justice just came out with a recommendation to law enforcement agencies to hire people with criminal records. To be I more was inclusive. Say, the, the, the elimination of standards. Yeah. Correct. So not only that, they want to do away with polygraphs. They want to, quote, relax. I love it. <laughs> relax. Relax. Oh. I, and, I, and, I, uh, I smoked a little weed in high school uh, eight years, eight years um, before I applied uh, to a law. And that was that was enough to them not even look at me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and well, so 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 now you you diminish the standards and then you hire people just like, OK, remember just a few months ago in Memphis. Those that group of officers that beat that that motorist to death. Yes. Well, none, not one of those people should have been hired. They all had histories of violence, including being gang related. Yeah. Right. We don't. We. we you would think that we would be students of history. I mean, do we remember the Miami yeah. River cops? You know exactly. I mean, what? Yeah. You get what you get, man. You get what you get. Um, it's troubling. It's troubling. So, so if I if I was if I was king for a day, I I tell you what the police don't need to be reformed. No. The police need the best PR company in the world because we suck at being benefactors to ourselves. Sure. The great work that cops do goes completely unnoticed goes completely unrecognized, goes completely uncelebrated, and and the 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 media controls the narrative. And law enforcement sucks at creating the the narrative. So yeah. 
I would, I would, I would, uh, I would do, I would create, um, you know, when, when, when we became an all volunteer military, right. The army was, was advertising, you know, we'll, we'll send you to college, the air force, you know, we'll do this. We'll we're do a signing bonus. The Navy did this. And what did the Marines do? The few, the proud, the Marines. And they became, that became the most effective campaign. Sure ever and that's what we need to do the few the proud the blue that's what we need we need to make it cool to be a cop we need to be the best at our at, at heralding what this profession does it is the most noble profession that exists and we suck at telling it you know what i think for a while we didn't want to tell everybody how good it was because it was our thing well now you know, now we need to a hundred percent best job in the world, best job in the world. Um, well, it's, it's no, it's not the best job in the world. The job sucks because of what we, what we have done to it. Well, now, with, with that being said, um, there's no other job other than, I guess, being in the military where you get to do every day. You're out there taking care of people, making communities yeah. safe, locking up yeah. bad guys. Putting, uh, you know, putting uh, bad people in jail and taking care of good people. Um, if we can just get, if we can just work on that culture part of it, um, and and maybe start caring about each other a little bit more, I think we could be able to do some really great things. Um, yeah, I agree with you. So, um, what what my ask is of of your listeners and and the, your viewers is go to the woundedblue.org see who we are see what we do if you're struggling reach out to us if you know someone who's struggling reach out to us um we're going to be announcing our third annual fourth annual national law enforcement survival summit you do not want to waste any time this is going to probably be coming out within a week or so on our website and you want to you it's going to be september 26 through the 29th of 2024 in Las Vegas at the fabulous Ahern Hotel, a very cool boutique hotel. You don't want to, you want to make sure that you get your opportunity to go because we're going to, we're, we're capping it at 200 people. There are no more because it, it needs to be intimate for the, for it to have the power that it does. So don't waste time. Sign up for it now. It's cheap. It's 325 bucks. The hotel is a hundred bucks a night. It's the best training. It may be life changing. It might be life saving for you or for someone you know. So, and we advocate bringing your bringing your spouse. So that's awesome. We've got that coming up, and we also have a tremendous documentary film. It's on Amazon.com called The Wounded Blue. Excellent. If if every American saw this, they would come to understand in a in a very graphic way the challenges our cops face. I mean, you'll you you'll watch it, and and you're going to be reaching for your tissues. Sure. Right. It's a it's a very very powerful film. So um, the other thing is, is I would ask you to support the Wounded Blue. I'd ask that you go there. And and give ten bucks a month. Go get on that routine. Ten dollars a month, revolving. Um, if you are if you are a business owner, and you want to really play a role, become a sponsor of the Wounded Blue. We've got a tremendous uh, um, conference that 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 like I told you that um, we get a lot of a lot of support from um, from different uh, businesses. That that you know we, and so though and go to our partners page on our website. See a lot of different are. ways to support. Yeah, just uh, but that's what we need, man. We need we need the law enforcement community to be that thin blue line that we promise. Yeah, that with be the be that family that uh, that that you know we were we we were always told we were part of, and the wounded blue is that family that's awesome and we'll make sure to put all that information in the show notes ladies and gentlemen randy sutton randy thanks for your time today brother 
Um, My pleasure, man. Thank you for giving us all that additional information and uh, look forward to seeing you in September out in Vegas. Great. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.